The Pulse School on realagriculture.com is brought to you by BASF. Hey, Kara Ustros here with realagriculture.com. I am back here today with another Pulse School episode, and I have here with me Jessica Enns, who is a general manager of Western Applied Research Corporation. How are you doing today? I'm good. Thanks for asking. So we are here today to talk about some of the research you've conducted when it comes to herbicide layering. Do you want to dive a bit into what that research is? Yeah, you bet. So we've been doing quite a bit of this work over the past five years. Um, And most recently, I was talking about some of the different combinations that are available for producers in lentils. So what are some of the things when it comes to lentils? Uh, So the biggest thing that we're really looking at right now is weed control in lentils. That's the biggest problem that farmers are producing or farmers are facing. Uh, So what we wanted to focus on is some of the pre-seed residual options that they could use. So what are some of the options out there? Uh, Well, mainly we're trying to focus on something like the group 14s and group 15s. So the big ones that we're really looking at is Valterra. So that has flumioxazin. That's a group 14. And then Fierce has flumioxazin and pyroloxisolquone. And that's a group 15. Uh, The other one that we've really been focusing on is Focus. And that's pyroloxisolquone and carfentrazone. Okay. And so do you want to dive a bit into what exactly the, obviously you've been looking at the different herbicides, but what exactly the research is and why it's important? Yeah, you bet. So the reason that this is so important is because farmers right now are relying so heavily on our group two herbicides for that in-crop weed control. And we just really don't have it. We just have so much group two uh, residual weeds that we're just not getting the control we need. And so we're seeing a lot of yield loss. So what we really wanted to do was kind of highlight the benefits of herbicide layering and how you can use it in your field. Um, So for example, in this demonstration, what we show was 16 different combinations that you could use and how they would work best in your field and what weeds that they really control. Um, And so what we really found is that with kochia and wild mustard and canola, that there was quite a few options that you could use. There were some that did better than others, but in general, we are really happy with the way that they all worked out, regardless of the growing season um, and the environmental conditions that they were located in. And where was your research conducted? So this was um, at four different locations. We looked at Saskatoon. We worked with the University of Saskatchewan, uh, Swift Current, Redverse, and then, of course, at Scott. So then you're obviously dealing with a bunch of different soil profiles as well there. Absolutely. And that's why we picked the four different locations, because we wanted to see how the different soil textures, as well as the different environmental conditions, would really factor into it. Um, Because sometimes we do have that issue with not having enough moisture to really activate those soil applied herbicides. Um, So we wanted to make sure that we could give producers a good representation of what we're seeing across Saskatchewan. And why do you think it's important that producers are aware of this work you guys have been doing? Well, I think producers are aware of the concept of herbicide layering. It's not something that's new, but I think producers just maybe need a little bit of a nudge to kind of utilize it. It is more of an expensive cost than just, say, going in with an in-crop herbicide, but I don't think they understand how effective it is. We're seeing substantial weed control, and this is something that we really need to start pushing because relying on our same old, same old group two in-crop products are just not cutting it, and we're really starting to see that that's starting to affect the amount of herbicide resistant weeds we're seeing. So we just really want producers to be aware that there are other options and that, you know, if you do it properly, um, you can still make money with um, these residual products, even though they might be a little bit more expensive um, and that they are a long-term option. Now you mentioned kochia. What are some of the other troublesome weeds you guys uh, looked at? Uh, Well, in lentils, there's always a few, but the main ones that we really honed in on was wild mustard and, uh, canola. So these readings that we took um, occurred prior to seeding, um, seven days after we sprayed the products in the spring or fall, uh, after emergence, and then at 21 days after emergence, and then 56 days after emergence. So we really wanted to get a good idea of what was happening throughout the entire growing season. And so this is what we based all of our results on is how did they perform early on? And then how did they end up having an overall effect on our yield? Okay, any surprises you guys found from some of this research? Uh, Not really. We were expecting to see uh, residual herbicides do a little bit better than anything that just, you know, um, something like glyphosate or even just um, 
Goldwing by itself. So we found that the residual products did the best, something like the flumeoxazine and the flumeoxazine with pyroxophalone. Those two did the best, which is not really surprising. Um, one thing I was uh, happy to see is that the Goldwing with the glyphosate did quite well, and that one was quite consistent. Um, and that's something, a product that we don't typically use that often. So I was quite happy to see how well it worked um, in combination with the other residual products. What sort of impacts did you see when it comes to yield with these? Uh, so the big thing that we found is that anything that had a residual component was the most effective. So we found um, around 10 different combinations really resulted in the same yield. The lowest yields, though, were your in-crop solo, so that's kind of your basic check, uh, spring-applied glyphosate, and then spring-applied glyphosate with heat, which is your cefalopenicil, uh, and then spring-applied glyphosate with your gold wing. So it really kind of came down to the fact that anything that didn't have a residual component uh, tended to yield quite poorly versus all the ones that had a residual did quite well. So that was um, a very large trend that we saw at all four sites. Uh, so this project was funded through ADOPT, which is the Agriculture Demonstration of Practices and Technology through the Canadian Agriculture Partnership, as well as through SAS Paul's Growers. Okay, anything else you'd like to add about some of the things you found or any messages you'd like to send to producers? Um, I guess the big thing that I would like to say is, you know, we were using 16 different combinations and that just tells you that there's so many options out there. You don't have to just stick with one product. There's so many things you can do. And really what we found is no matter if you're using ethafluralin, which is your edge, or if you want to use Focus or Desidua, uh, Volterra or Fierce, any of those products that you like, um, as long as you're using something, anything was better than just glyphosate alone. So if you are trying to tackle those weeds, you don't have to be loyal to a specific brand. Um, but just kind of try and pay attention to your groups that you're using, like your group 14s, your group 15s, your group 3s. Um, try and rotate those modes of action and just try and be preventative. Um, you might not think you have that big of an issue with your weeds and your lentils, but uh, if you continue to use just an in-crop herbicide, you're going to have those problems. So why not just nip it in the bud and uh, get on that train early enough so that it's not something you have to worry about in the future. Absolutely. And if producers are looking for more information on this, how do they find it? Uh, well, we have the information available on our website. SPG also has it available on their website. Uh, and if you want to just dive into it a little more, you can certainly contact me. I have no problem answering emails or a phone call. Um, yeah, we have the information available on the website everywhere. So it's pretty easy to find. Okay. Thank you very much, Jessica. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you.